It's my pleasure to introduce Sico, Sico de Knecht, and he'll be speaking to us about your research matters to others. So Sico uh, lives in Amsterdam with his wife, his son, and his brand new daughter. Very uh, congratulations on that, and I hope she's growing healthy. And um, so between 2016 and 2020, Sico was the editor-in-chief of the Science and Higher Education news site called Science Guide. And today is the program coordinator of the University of Utrecht Open Science Program. And uh, welcome, Siko. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'll share my screen with all of you guys and see whether this all works fine. It seems to be working right. Let's get right into it because we've already lost a minute. Um, I've changed the title of my talk because that's sort of the thing you do when you're presenting at a conference, right? So. I'm now calling it Why Popularize Where You Can Problematize. And I'll be talking about science communication, but actually more even about public engagement. And I'm trying, uh, as I am the first speaker today, to also sort of create a couple of categories by which we can work the rest of the day and maybe in a panel discussion uh, and make some distinctions that might be useful to separate certain types of communications from each other. So. Uh, a little bit about myself. I studied psychobiology and I did a master's in neurobiology at the University of Amsterdam. This now seems ages ago, uh, the early 2000s. I was one of the first to do this interdisciplinary psychobiology uh, bachelor's. Um, after that, I did a PhD in neurophysiology, also at the University of Amsterdam. I seem to stick to universities at certain points. And I was an editor at a site called the Fusi, which was specifically uh, designed for um, academics, young academics from bachelor's to PhD, to share with each other, not with the general audience, but especially amongst each other, their views and insights in their respective fields. So it could be neurobiologists, but also people from law, people from economics, from everywhere. Uh, after that, I uh, decided after four years of doing a PhD that uh, it was very clear to me that it wasn't going to be finished within uh, another year, and I looked for a new career. And then I became the editor-in-chief at Science Guide, which is a website that writes about higher education and research, but not in a science communication style, as in presenting findings from the field of research, but more uh, on a science journalism level. We were talking mostly about uh, policy, about the ways we should approach science and higher education. And uh, as a little side project that I also presented the National Wetenschaps Quiz 2019, because the VPRO had decided to drop the NWQ and I was very much against it. So I just decided to uh, make my own version of it in the Bali. And uh, since September, I've been an open science coordinator at Duke Church University. And today I'll be trying to position open science and public engagement uh, next to each other. And um, let's start with a little con uh, conceptualization first. And I'll do that in a sort of very summarized and uh, also simplified version of history, um, history of science communication. So when we go back a couple of decades, I think uh, that there are clear examples that science saw, uh, scientists saw themselves as people in this, their specific own realm and uh, connect their connection to the outside world, to society was something that was not entirely relevant. Um, they were there to do their own thing. And for example, when the first National Wetenschaps Quiz was uh, was thought of, the, the organizer, which I interviewed once for Science Guide, uh, told me that he wrote a letter, this is 1992, I think, to all the Dutch hoogleraar professors, whether they could help him uh, in creating a science test for on national television. And of the 6,000 people, two professors responded. And most people actually thought that this was not the thing that we should be doing. We should not engage with the public audience. This science is something that is zuiver wetenschappelijk and should be kept to scientists themselves. Well, after that, we've seen a revolution, which I think you all recognize these, uh, these pictures, where science has become something that has to be popularized. And uh, we see TED Talks that are, are about, uh, that are scientists talking about their research and what it means to the general public. There is the Universiteit van Nederland, this is the Nationale Wetenschapsbestuur, are, some of them are quite Dutch examples, I realize now in this uh, Benelux, but I think you, you get the gist of what I'm saying. And what I'm trying to argue here today is that we, should, that we are moving, it is inevitable, but it's also highly to be cheered on, we're, we're moving to a more public space where science and society interact with each other in all kinds of different ways, social media, podcasts, uh, in citizen science, etc. 
Now, when I talk about science communication, I think a lot of people, especially for neuroscience, will take, have this uh, view, have this view of what it means. So um, th these are people trying to tell us that uh, walking five miles a day keeps Alzheimer's away, that we are our brain, there is no free will, and sticking electrodes into people's heads can cure them of the most uh, different diseases around. And I, for one, think that this uh, that this won't do, because it, this if this is the image that comes to mind, uh, we are communicating the wrong thing about science. And I'm asking you to maybe think for yourself, what binds these people? What, what, is, what is similar in between them? I'll give you 10 seconds to think about it for yourself. So you might think what bind the, binds these people is that the, for neuroscientists, you have to have male pattern boldness. No but it's a good observation. Uh, maybe being photographed with the brain makes you look smart. No, it doesn't, but it is very easy to find pictures of neuroscientists being photographed with the brains for some reason. Maybe you think that all neuroscientists wear glasses. Uh, some do, but not all. Or you have to work at Amsterdam to do neuroscience. No, but the real serious point here is that these are the people we usually see communicating about science. They, they are a very frequent guest in talk shows. And to be honest, I think they often also talk about something that is quite outside of their field. But more, more overarching in this is that their interpretation of science communications is, is that it is your job to popularize science. And I will argue that it's not what it should be. Uh, but first, delve into a little bit of sociology. Uh, I'm uh, borrowing this two-stage process, which is the dominant view of science popularization. Uh, I'm borrowing it from uh, Stephen Hillgardner, and um, he described the, 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 the way, so this the science and technology studies uh, person, and their job is to describe how science is performed, now not how it ought or should to be performed, but um, this is really a description of how science uh, communication in this case is performed. And um, he observed that you usually see this broken down into two stages. There's the stage of production and there's the stage of dissemination. And in the stage of production, the actors are scientists. And if you communicate within this, the field of production, you have recipients that are inside of your scientific community. And there is an idea about all the information being transferred within this domain uh, to be genuine scientific knowledge. Now, when it comes to dissemination, the actor is a popularizer, which uh, I think if you go a couple of decades back, were mostly science journalists or maybe people from science communication themselves, but now are these days more often the scientists themselves as well. And the recipient is this, what we call the general audience. And in order to speak to them, you have to popularize knowledge. And so you see that there's a direct communication within the field of production, but there is a sort of appropriate simplification. Um, so you have to uh, change gears between different levels when we talk about dissemination. Uh, I think if you take like next week to observe uh, everything you see that's communicated about science and try to put this process uh, uh, onto what you're seeing, you, you might find that you have a better view of what exactly the difference is and what the different realms are. But I think there are a couple of problems with this because it, they contain implicit messages about science, about scientists, and about the general audience that I think are simply not true. For one, this type of communication creates a false image of science that it's a robust process, and more importantly, that it's beyond any doubt, that scientific fact is irrefutable. And you might say, oh, well, Seiko, that's not really what they're saying themselves, maybe, but it's what's being echoed by people around these scientists. It's what you hear in politics. It's science. It is scientific fact. The science shows us. Uh, and also, whenever there's a problem, like an, a difference of opinion, the first response of, for example, a Royal Academy or an Institute will always be, we have to explain it again. But that is not the same as communication. Also, it creates a false image of scientists. It portrays them as smart people, yes, but it, that is different from portraying science as something difficult. 
it puts the person first and not the actual question or the actual science. It also portrays people as ethically neutral. And if there's anything that we all know deep down in our hearts is that we all have convictions. We all have assumptions. We all use definitions and we are not ethically neutral, even when we are performing research. You might, uh, there, I, I would argue that there might be a difference between an opinion and a scientific opinion in the fact that the latter should always be uh, something you are, uh, you are willing to drop at any, go at any second if you're refuted by other evidence. But honestly, especially in debates that are on this high tension level, as we're seeing this year, for example, around coronavirus and uh, mouth mask, for example, you see that people in general don't like changing their own opinion. It also creates a, a wrong idea of the general audience. Um, I would argue there is no general audience. This is not a thing. There are audiences, but there is no general audience. And there's no way to speak to a general audience in a, a satisfactory manner. And that also assumes that everybody in the general audience, uh, every, everyone is a layman. And every, nobody knows anything remotely uh, relevant to your subject about it. And that you always need simplification. And this I would call the myth of science. And this myth is perpetuated by this view of having to popularize science instead of problematize it. And we see that this has problems, inherent problems. So just a couple of examples, what can happen? When there is a disagreement among scientists, which there always is, but is always kept out of view from the general audience or other audiences, and then suddenly there is disagreement that is out in the open, the public might decide, well, I don't know, they don't even know, why should I care and why should I act in a responsible manner? Also, when farmers find out that uh, this, there's a certain way of measuring nitrogen deposits in nature, and this, uh, this so sometimes benefits one, but also uh, has bad drawbacks for other people, then they might not be willing to trust the RIVM that well in the next round when the, the nitrogen deposits are being discussed. And when these institutes are not open about how they collect their data, how they analyze it, and you have to actually, in this case, go to the judge to force them to open up their analyses, this creates a huge, huge uh, break between science and society. And it creates uh, a situation where, where trust is going down to a very low level. Uh, and also when uh, you are putting a certain professor in all talk shows that are uh, on the Dutch television to have him tell that eating red meat makes you angry and then it turns out that this person was actually falsifying data, we can all uh, understand that this is not really the way forward for science. So back to my uh, categorization. What should we do? Where should we go? I really think we are moving in the right direction, but to really make science a public thing, we have to do a couple of things more. And this is coming from the open science view, uh, which is shared with me, but also a lot of colleagues at the Utrecht University. We really believe that science and society are now at this, as, at this stage too much uh, differentiated from each other. And there, there's too, too many barriers between them. And we believe that through our open science project uh, program uh, and by using open access, fair data and fair uh, software, uh, different method of reward, rewarding and incentivizing researchers and focusing on public engagement, we can actually create sci a science that works for the world, that uh, benefits the good life, and it involves society. Now, you might think, uh, yes, that's all nice and easy, but where in my research should I actually engage with the public? So this is our current model. If you look at this empirical cycle, uh, I, I just took one example of an empirical cycle. Maybe you don't agree with exactly how it looks like here, but yeah, let's just assume that we all know we're talking about the empirical cycle. The one moment in the research project uh, process that we are actually actively looking to find an audience, and in a lot of cases, the general audience, is when we want to communicate results talk about output and popularize this output. So we found that males and females are different in this and this way because we did this research. And then usually in the communication about it, the focus is wholly on the output and not on the process. I think 
there are many, many other parts in our research project where we can involve stakeholders that are from specific disciplines, from specific uh, groups in our society, stakeholders. For example, gathering problems that are relevant to specific groups. This can be a patient group, this can be a professional group like psychologists, this can be uh, the, a group that uh, is involved in, uh, in something that is uh, only slightly related to your research topic, but they can be a very decent uh, party to help you with setting your agenda and uh, asking new questions that are relevant to society. So reflecting upon what questions to ask is something that you can do with a lot of uh, a lot of groups around society and they will always and this is the beauty of it challenge your assumptions and definitions so maybe i was in the field of epilepsy at least that's what we always said but basically i was studying interneurons and neurons and in the four or five years i did my phd i never once met an epilepsy patient I went to a couple of conferences where people uh, put posters up about patient care and I just generally didn't care and walked right past them. And in the end, when I look back, it always felt a bit preposterous that I was saying that I was doing epilepsy research when I've never actually really looked into the disease itself. But these people would, if you actually start talking to patients, to carers, to um, to the family members of these patients, they will tell you that there's all kinds of questions they still have that they need clarification on and they want to actually work with you on setting these new agendas and challenging your assumptions that you might have. This helps you discuss what are relevant contexts and check your hypothesis with the initial problem that you started out with. And it can actually help you involve stakeholders in data gathering and talking about how you should analyze that data. And then a little bit closer to the, the place we started off with, when we communicate result, results, we rarely do that, uh, like on a scientific level, we only do this to our peers. You never see or rarely see a scientific paper that has an abstract that is actually legible for somebody who's not in this specific field. So there, there's only two, there's only these, these two stages. Again, there's the production where we talk specifically to scientists, and then there's the dissemination where we talk to a general audience, but there are loads and loads of areas in between. And maybe sharing your preprint article at forehand with people that are directly involved with the problem you're studying might actually improve the paper and make it more legible for the people who are interested in it for all myriad of reasons. And then in the end, we do this evaluation and see how we can perform our research better next time. But maybe we should more often ask ourselves how this research has contributed to the good life. Are we still in an alley that really benefits anybody? So I'm not saying here that all science should be directly relevant to a specific stakeholder group. If you have taken that away, uh, taken that from my talk, I might have phrased it uh, in, a, in a wrong way. But what I'm saying is that these are questions I think we should ask as researchers. Have I connected to the people that are directly related with what I'm studying? Or do I even know who these people are? And are we still studying something relevant with all of us? Because just let's be very clear about this. There are an infinite numbers of scientific questions that can be answered. And there is really no objective way of saying which, which question is better than the other, but maybe involving people who are directly influenced by the thing you were researching might help you set the agenda a bit better. So my explicit new messages that I think come forward by drawing into the drawing these stakeholders into your process will be the following. We will create a more realistic image of science and show that it's a process based in doubt and discussion and that scientific fact can and should always be challenged. And when it's done, it is not something to worry about. It's actually a thing of beauty. But we should not only keep this information to ourselves as researchers, but share it with society. We should also, in this way, be able to portray a really more realistic image of society of scientists. They are smart, yes, they are doing something difficult, yes, but they are flawed people as well. And they should be, you should be able to criticize them also on their motives. And that researchers have their own beliefs and that these things siphon into the research they do. 
And then to close off with, there is no general audience. There are many different audiences of people, stakeholders involved in very different levels to your research, your, your research topic, to, uh, uh, your research topic. And simplification is not the term here. It is contextualization. How is this relevant for you? And if, if we want to have a discussion about this, on, on what level should we meet? I think that's the end of my presentation.